Hey everyone, I hope you're all doing well and thanks for tuning in to Facebook Connect. For those of you joining for the first time, Connect is usually our big conference with developers coming together from all over the world as we show off the latest in virtual and augmented reality. Now things are a little different this year, but we've got some exciting new things to show you and I'm really looking forward to it. But first, I just wanna say that I hope you are all staying healthy, safe, and good during this time. For a lot of us, COVID means living more of our lives online. Going to school, working, hanging out with friends. More is happening online now, but, but it's not quite the same. Most of us have been on video calls where people keep talking over each other and staring at a grid of faces for hours just isn't always the most natural way to interact. What we're missing is this feeling of presence. The feeling of actually being right there with someone else, with all of the different sensations that that includes. So that's what the whole fields of virtual and augmented reality are about, delivering that sense of presence. And that's why a lot of people have been spending more time in VR since COVID hit. I know I have. You know, it's a way to get out there even when you can't leave your house and to see your friends and feel connected even when you're physically apart. And with all the heaviness in the world this year, it's also a way to have some fun and, and find some moments of joy. I've definitely been playing a lot more with, with friends recently, especially games like Echo VR, which is, is kind of like playing full contact Frisbee in zero gravity space, uh, or Arizona Sunshine, where you can stand back to back with your friends as you fight off wave after wave of zombies. I've also been enjoying Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes, which is this great party game where you're in VR and you have to defuse a bomb with the help of your friends who are outside of VR and uh, they're helping you solve the bomb's puzzles. And it gets hilarious pretty quickly depending on how helpful uh, or not uh, your friends are. Now, if you've tried experiences like this, uh, you know just how magical it is to be together in one of these worlds with your friends. And, as the ecosystem keeps growing and the hardware keeps getting better and better, we're starting to see how whole new categories of experiences could take place in VR in the future. So I'm looking forward to showing you what we've been working on, but before we dive in, you may have noticed that this event got a new name, Facebook Connect, and it's brought to you by a new group, Facebook Reality Labs. And that's because this work to build the next computing platform, to deliver that sense of presence and immersion, and to make it the best platform for connecting with people you care about. That work increasingly requires us to extend beyond just our, our Oculus virtual reality product lines to include a lot more of the work that we're doing into augmented reality, into all kinds of long-term research, into more natural interactions like neural interfaces, uh, into home and other wearable devices, and into software development, like what we're doing with Horizon and what we have done for the whole history of our company. So uh, we have one group that pulled together all of our augmented reality and virtual reality efforts, which we are calling Facebook Reality Labs. And now we also have one event to discuss all of this work, which we're calling Facebook Connect. Our goal is to deliver the products and technology that let you feel like you're together with the people you want, no matter where you are or the physical distance between you. So today, we're gonna talk about how we're going to get there. Now first, let's talk about augmented reality. The goal here is to develop some normal size, nice looking glasses uh, that you can wear all day and interact with holograms, digital objects, and information uh, while still being present with the people and world around you. Maybe you want to just sit on your couch and have a friend teleport and have their hologram sit right next to you to play games or just talk or hang out. You know, maybe you're walking somewhere and you want directions or you see something awesome and you want to share it without having to take out your phone. Maybe you don't want to have to carry your phone around at all or have to worry about having it take you away from the moment. You're going to be able to do all of this with a pair of glasses. Now, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done on some of the foundational technologies. Later today, uh, we're gonna share more about Project ARIA, which is the first research device that we're gonna be putting out into the world to help us understand the software and hardware needed to build our first consumer augmented reality glasses. And we're starting to put together all the different building blocks, including the, the input systems, the display systems, spatial audio. We have a team of computational neuroscientists and engineers working on non-invasive neural interfaces and ways to use subtle gestures to control augmented reality objects in the world. There are still hard problems to solve. 
But this has the opportunity to open up a lot of new ways for people to connect, to work, learn, and play in the future. And we now have line of sight into how we're going to get there in the coming years. Now, in the meantime, uh, there's a lot that we can do today with the technology that we've already created in order to develop great smart glasses. They're not yet augmented reality glasses, but they're on the road there. So a couple of years ago, I started meeting with some of the best eyeglasses makers around the world. And, and this journey took me to Milan, where I met with the founder of a company called Essilor Luxottica. They're the best in the world at making glasses. And they make Ray-Ban and Oakley, and they design and build frames for everyone from Armani to Versace. And after spending time with their team and visiting their factory, I knew that they were the right partner for us to help bring the best technology together with the best glasses. And of course, in the future, you know, people aren't all going to wear one or two different styles of glasses, uh, like we just have a couple of different kinds of phones. So we need to support a lot of different designs and styles, and that's what Luxottica does. Now, we don't have a product yet to share with you today, but I am excited to share that we have formed a multi-year partnership, starting with building and releasing our first pair of smart glasses next year. Now, I can't go into full product details yet, uh, but they're going to be the next step on the road to augmented reality glasses, and they look pretty good too. This is going to be a big milestone in starting to integrate the core technologies into a regular glasses form factor and seeing how people use them. And speaking of that, the most important part of any AR product is the experiences it can deliver. And I'm happy with how the AR software ecosystem is coming together too. More than 600 million people use AR across our apps and devices every month. People are creating some really awesome things with Spark AR, which anyone can use to build AR effects for Facebook and Instagram. There's also AR shopping technology that lets you see how furniture is going to look in your room, or how makeup or glasses are going to look on your face before you buy them. We're already seeing some of the creativity that augmented reality can unlock, and I think that this is all just going to get a lot better as AR starts to become even more mainstream. Now, let's talk about virtual reality. We are continuing to build out the Quest platform with better hardware, software, and content. And we're starting to see more areas where VR provides a clearly better experience than other platforms. So take gaming. You know, I think Quest is already the best VR gaming platform, but it's about to get a lot better because a couple of years ago, we started working with some of the best game studios to produce AAA franchises for Quest. And today, uh, we're going to share some of this work from developers like Respawn, ILM XLab, Universal Games, and more. And we're continuing to bring even more of these games to Quest. This fall, Oculus Link is coming out of beta. And Oculus Link allows you to use a compatible gaming PC to play Rift titles on Quest. In the future, it's going to support 90 hertz for PC gameplay, and we're working on a new UI, so you're going to be able to find all of your PC games right alongside your Quest apps, all in one place. So that's coming next year, and it will give you access to a lot of native Quest features while you are using Link. Another important area is social products. We're building new social experiences like Horizon, which is now an invite-only beta, and it lets you create your own worlds where you can go and hang out with your friends. Uh, we're also building experiences like venues, which I know a lot of you are using right now to watch this live stream. And I'm really focused on, on this area of, of social software because, as I've said a few times, I think that augmented and virtual reality are going to be the most social platforms ever. And we're really just scratching the surface on this right now. We're also seeing how VR can change work. Some of our Oculus teams already have their meetings in VR. And since COVID, I held my first management team meeting entirely in VR too. And I have to say, in some ways, it already felt more real than a video call because we had a shared sense of space. You know, I always find uh, that I have a harder time remembering discussions on video calls uh, because from a visual and auditory perspective, there's no shared sense of space. Everything just looks flat. But in VR, even before we have avatars with full fidelity and facial expressions, just having that shared visual sense of space and spatial audio, uh, that for everyone else in the room, the room and people's locations looks the same to everyone else, um, you can hear where someone's talking from, it just makes a huge difference. Now, 
more people are going to work remotely in the future. Now, I think that VR is going to give you the ability to work from anywhere without having to feel a lot of that separation that current remote work setups bring. Now, Facebook has already said that for our company, we expect 50% of our employees to work remotely long term. So we're invested in building out the tools that we need for our own people to work from anywhere, and then we're going to deliver them to the world. There are other advantages to VR for work too. Like you can design your own perfect workstation with infinite screen space and ability to teleport between different teams and projects easily. So we'll cover all of this and more in the rest of the session today. Uh, but before I sign off, I want to show you something new that we've been working on. And for this, uh, we're going to need Boz, who heads up Facebook Reality Labs. I've been keeping him pretty busy during this lockdown, and here's a quick summary of some of our conversations over the last period. Really, Mark? I mean, that's five in a row. I told you I've had a lot of practice. Been spending a lot more time in VR. Does he ever sleep? You know, Quest is awesome, but I've been thinking, you know, people love it, but there are a few places where we could make, make it, it better. better. I mean, the screen's great, but I wonder if we could get 50% more pixels in there to make it even crisper. Uh, yeah, I'll see what I can do. Uh, this is why I always lose in Echo Arena. Taylor, Mark wants to know if we can make the screen more crisp. Yeah, we can do that. We could throw in a single high-res LCD panel. Great. But let's make sure we keep the built-in IPD adjustment. Got it. But keep the built-in IPD adjustment, of course. We can keep the built-in IPD adjustment? It's never been done before with a single panel, but we'll see what we can do. Okay. I also think we could try to make the whole thing lighter. Let's try to cut 10% off the weight. Could we put it on a diet? Yeah, I think we could shave a few grams. You got it, Mark. Leslie thinks we can shave off a few grams. All right, one more thing. We've got to make the next version a lot more powerful. Let's see if we can advance the processor by a couple of generations and maybe add more memory. Ciao, my buddy, my man. What about that new VR dedicated processor we've been working on with Qualcomm? The Snapdragon XI2? That is not an easy ask. We're talking about an entirely new architecture. Mark, you're, you're on mute. If the team can pull this off, I think we're going to have something really great here. Well, we're wondering if we could try out one more thing. Yeah, we have an idea. What if? We lower the price. Yeah, great idea. <laughs> what are you thinking, 350? Mark, come on, man. All right, all right. I'll think about it. See you guys soon. So that's a pretty big to-do list. But we want the next version of Quest to be another big step forward. You know, we want virtual reality to be something that anyone can just jump into with the best and most immersive experiences out there. And we want it to be available to as many people as possible. Quest was a big step towards that goal. For the first time, you had real virtual reality with full freedom of movement so you could walk around with no wires to break that feeling of presence. And from day one, we were selling them as fast as we could make them. More than 90% of people who used Quest this year hadn't used an Oculus before. This is the form factor that's going to introduce people to virtual reality. And today, we are taking the next big step forward. And I'm excited to share with all of you Oculus Quest 2. Quest 2 has our highest resolution display ever with 50% more pixels. It's more powerful with a custom Qualcomm Snapdragon XR2 processor and six gigs of memory. It weighs 10% less than the original Quest and has a new soft strap, so it's even easier to carry around. It has new touch controllers that are more ergonomic and have battery life improvements. It is shipping on October 13th, and we are opening pre-orders today. And it starts at just $299. The team has done an incredible job, and I am really proud of what we've built here. 
Quest 2 is lighter, faster, and has a better display than the first generation, and it's $100 more affordable. It is fully wireless, and it has hands down the best content library of any VR system out there. Now, there are a bunch of improvements that we've made to the hardware. We've been working on this with Qualcomm for years, and Quest 2 is the first major consumer device that runs on the Snapdragon XR2 platform. It's fully customized for VR and AR, with support for multiple cameras and technology like fixed foveated rendering. And the end result is a more immersive experience with crisper graphics, more dynamic environments, and ultimately, just a more realistic feeling of presence. The display is better. Instead of two OLEDs, Quest 2 has a single LCD for super high-resolution visuals, and a new system for adjusting the optics that makes it easier to dial in the visual settings that are right for you. We've redesigned the touch controllers with more efficient tracking and optimized haptics. The new controllers deliver a better feeling of hand presence and stronger physical feedback. And for apps that don't use our full hand tracking, this is gonna make a better experience all around. And we've also been making a lot of software updates too. For example, you know, a lot of people have been using VR uh, for fitness. It's probably one of the most fun ways to get in some quick cardio. And you know, I mean, Beat Saber is, is a bit more motivating than a treadmill most mornings. So we've built in a system level fitness tracker that helps you keep tabs on just how much exercise you're getting while playing some of your favorite titles. It's called Oculus Move, and it lets you set VR fitness goals and track them across different games and apps. And we're also experimenting with real-time stats and in-game overlays, and we're gonna start testing this out on Quest later this year. Now, these are just a few of the improvements that make Quest 2 the best all-in-one VR experience out there. And I've really been enjoying using mine during this lockdown, and I'm looking forward to getting these in more of your hands in just a few weeks. Now, I wanna make sure that I give a special shout out to everyone in our developer community and all of you who've been on this journey with us. You know, five months ago, uh, we shared that there were 10 developers who had made more than $2 million in revenue from Quest content alone. And today, there are more than 35 different titles on Quest that generate revenue in the millions of dollars. People have spent more than $150 million on Quest content. This ecosystem is growing. And now, with Quest 2 priced at just $299, a lot more people are going to be able to experience VR soon. So this is becoming a self-sustaining ecosystem now, and a lot of this success comes down to developers building great experiences. Because every time that someone gasps out loud when they see their hands in VR, um, or instinctively ducks or dodges something, you know, that's the result of all the effort that you put in. So, so I wanna thank all of you, because we are on this mission together. Now, walking the floor at Connect and, and getting uh, to demo some of the new experiences that you've all built, um, that was awesome. And I hope we're gonna be able to do that and get together in person again one day soon. Uh, but I also hope that together, uh, we can build something that, that helps us stay connected even when we are on different continents. Something that, that can help us feel present no matter where we are. You know, that's what technology should be all about. And it is something that virtual reality can uniquely help us accomplish. So if we can build experiences that are as vivid, and meaningful as being there together in person, now that's gonna unlock a lot of amazing things. It's gonna mean that you're free to live and work and learn anywhere you want, to meet friends in new places, to explore and create new worlds. For the first time, we're going to be able to step outside the limits of the physical world and experience things and be part of communities that weren't even possible before. And I can't wait to create this with all of you. And now, to talk more about the journey ahead, I'm going to hand it off to Boz. Thanks, Mark. At Facebook Reality Labs, we often say that we see AR and VR as the next step in computer evolution. From mainframes to desktops, desktops to laptops, and laptops to smartphones, these are what comes next. But why? Why do we say that? What right do we have to make that claim? And the answer, I think, goes to the very heart of what computers are and what they're for, and why a social media company acquired a virtual reality company, and why our VR conference is called Connect in the first place. I mean, everyone knows that computers are, are useful. I mean, they help us accomplish tasks 
more efficiently and, and accurately. But from the very beginning, they've also had another important purpose, to connect people. An early computer scientist to make this case was Doug Engelbart, famous for the mother of all demos, where he debuted things like the mouse, the graphical user interface, and hyperlinked text. But he also debuted shared document editing and even video conferencing way back in 1968. Along with his friend Stuart Brand, Engelbart understood that the coming computer revolution was about more than better technology. It was about finding ways to help people share ideas and experiences with each other at a distance. Now that demo, in turn, inspired the groundbreaking work in places like Xerox PARC, Bell Labs, Stanford Research Institute, and others who made it possible for you to watch me on your computer today. Now these institutions were the inspiration for our recent name change to Facebook Reality Labs. Like computers, I believe augmented reality will be useful, but I also believe our work on it is what will make it transcend the distance between people. Especially now, during this time of social distancing, I know how much it means to me to be able to spend time in digital spaces with my parents and kids when we can't be in the same room. Millions of people across the world know what that's like too. And that's why, over the past year, our conviction about the importance of meaningful social presence has only grown, and why we remain committed to a world where emotional connection is no longer contingent on physical proximity. Where interaction at a distance is just as enriching, and sometimes just as demanding as interaction in person. Now, VR is the first half of that vision. And as all of you know, we've come a long way. I mean, I remember my first demo. It was, a, it was Toy Box. You know, you, you pick up a virtual dart gum and you could blast targets that were off floating in space. And it was very simple, but the potential struck me immediately. These days, VR is practically transcendent. I mean, I've climbed mountains, I've, I've battled robots in zero gravity, uh, I've explored alien planets. And I've done all these amazing things, but more often than not, I was doing them by myself. We have to continue to grow the VR community so that we can do more with our friends. So to bring in more people from more backgrounds, with Quest 2, we just built a better headset all around. I mean, it's lighter, it's faster, and it's got our highest resolution display ever. But all of that is small comfort if it doesn't fit right. That's why I'm pleased to announce some accessories we're launching for Quest 2. A fit pack, an elite strap, and the highly requested battery strap. Now, of course, it doesn't even matter how well it fits if it's not affordable which is why I'm so, so proud that we got the price of Quest 2 down to $299. That's a full $100 less than Quest. That is a big deal. And if you're wondering what to do with that extra $100, be sure to stick around to hear about the great content our developers are bringing to the platform. Now, as I said at OC6, we're also building out our capacity for meaningful social presence in workspaces. We all know this has been a hard year for jobs and businesses. I mean, for those of us who have the privilege of working from home, we may have lost the commute, but we've also lost some of the community. For my org, for a lot of Facebook, and for people all over the world, Portal has been a real hero these past few months. And as of this month, in addition to Workplace, you'll be able to take meetings on Portal via BlueJeans, GoToMeeting, WebEx, and Zoom. With Portal as a dedicated screen for video calls, it's a lot easier to be present with your coworkers, and it frees up your laptop as well. But still, Portal is only the beginning of virtual presence in the remote workplace. I've been really impressed this year by the new collaboration and productivity apps in Quest built by third-party pioneers. And this is an area that we're investing a lot in as well. Now, longer term, we envision an enterprise ecosystem with expanding platforms and new business models made possible across distances. Maria is going to tell you more about that later in the program. Now, the second half of our vision for the future of computing is augmented reality, or AR. We've made a lot of progress in the lab over the last year, and I'm excited to share it with you. At its essence, AR is a way of placing a digital, interactive layer on top of the real world. Already, a good smartphone can apply AR effects to things that it recognizes, like objects or pictures, bodies and faces. Three years ago, we created the Spark AR platform to help people do just that. And to date, more than 400,000 creators from 190 different countries have published effects for Facebook and Instagram the majority of whom, 55%, are women. Now together, they've published over 1.2 million AR effects that are used by hundreds of millions of people every month across our apps and devices. 
In just the last three months, more than 150 effect owners have hit over a billion views and uses. It's pretty incredible. And I'm excited to announce that beginning next year, we're opening Portal and Messenger for creator publishing as well. AR effects and chat are a really fun way to connect, especially for families. Now, the behaviors that we see validated today are gonna to help us build a better AR tomorrow. And the promise of AR is the promise of an information-rich world where your capacity for knowledge, reason, and awareness is expanded well beyond your physical capacity to see, know, or recall. Now, in some ways, we already live in that world. I mean, we can do a lot with a smartphone and a good internet connection. And yet, <laughs> and yet there's just so much more we could be doing. Our digital experiences are still mediated by heads down, eyes down, handheld devices. At Facebook Reality Labs, we ask ourselves, what if that was no longer the case? What could the future hold that's even better than this? Imagine a pair of glasses that could give you a 3D overlay of everything without having to look down at anything. This is a world where you accept a friend's phone call and a hologram appears right in your line of sight, where you're walking into a new city and the glasses not only give you directions, but they also help you spot hazards that you can't see. You wanna understand a foreign language? The world translates itself for you. Now, sometimes we talk about the benefits of AR like they're superpowers, and they are, but not everyone has the same abilities. So for a lot of people, maybe for most people, it's going to be simply empowering. Now, before you get your hopes up, I am not here to announce V1 of our fully functional AR glasses. I'm sorry to say we're just not there yet, but I do have the privilege of sharing with you some of the work we've been doing in the lab. As Mark alluded to earlier, this is Project Aria. Now these glasses are a precursor to working AR. It doesn't display any information inside the lens. It's not for sale and it's not a prototype. It's a research device that will help us understand how to build the software and hardware necessary for real working AR glasses. Starting in September, some specially trained Facebook employees and contractors will be wearing the glasses in real world conditions, indoors and outdoors. Their sensor platform will capture video and audio, eye tracking and location data, all to help us answer some of the questions that we need to ask before we release AR glasses to the general public. The first question is about hardware. <laughs> what do we put on the glasses? I mean, think of all the things necessary for AR to work. Outward sensors that can interpret the world, inward sensors that can track your eye movements and know where to show you information, and computers to process just all of that. And then, assuming you could fit everything you need into a pair of glasses, how would they perform under different light conditions or different weather conditions? Which sensors can you do without? And where might you need more? These are questions we can't answer in the lab. So like all good science, we have to put our theories to the test. Another question we have is about data. I mean, there's a lot of data sets about the world from the point of view of satellites or, or even automobiles, but there aren't a lot of what's called egocentric data sets. How do we program software that understands what the world looks like from a first person point of view? And more to the point, how do we balance what data we need to collect and process in the first place? At OC6, I introduced live maps, our effort at creating a shared virtual maps that are drawn from crowdsourced information, basically a 3D spatial internet. If we can design glasses that can both build and use live maps, we can deliver an AR experience that requires as little data as possible. Michael Abrash will share more later about the technical aspects being worked on in the lab, but before moving on, I'd like to show you guys a video we produced with the research team that introduces Project Aria. Aria is a comprehensive sensor platform that you wear like a pair of glasses and is used for research purposes. At the beginning of Aria, we actually evaluated many form factors. The hat, the bracelet, but we settled on the glasses because it could give us the closest human perspective. If you really want a system that is socially aware in a sense, it perceives the space like people do, you've got to look at the world from a human point of view. This allows us to start to teach devices to see, hear, and contextualize and making sense of the situation so that they could better help humans in the future. Imagine you lose your keys, and now you have a device that's able to tell you, hey, you left your keys on the coffee table. 
or the ability to take your human senses and feel as if you are somewhere else in the world. When we think about navigation, it's not just the turn-by-turn -turn direction that you're getting from your phone, but it's really navigate you to anything. Navigation also will unlock amazing possibilities in public safety and accessibility. Project ARIA is about figuring out the right privacy and safety and policy model long before we bring AR glasses to the world. We anonymize all the data, which means we blur faces and license plates. Starting in September, a few hundred Facebook workers will be wearing ARIA on campuses and in public spaces to help us collect data to uncover the underlying technical and ethical questions and start to look at answers to those. Where do we go from here? Well, we learn. The project is really going to be a series of iterations, right? It's going to develop over time, a bit like, you know, the internet. We're incredibly excited about the opportunity that Project Aria and the future of augmented reality brings. We're going to do this together, and it's going to be amazing. Now, as the video mentioned, in addition to the technical complexities we're navigating with Project Aria, we've also been working to answer some questions about how and when the glasses should be used. New technology often has unintended consequences and negative externalities, and our job is to get ahead of ours. AR glasses will be cool, but they shouldn't be rose-tinted. In order to wear the research glasses, people will undergo training on when and where they can gather data. Sensitive places like restrooms or prayer rooms are obviously off-limits. Before data we collect in public is used for research, the data is quarantined and faces and license plates are blurred. Like a mapping car, all participants will be easily identifiable by their clothing. You can find more details about Project ARIA online, and we'll continue to use the lessons we gather to inform how we build and launch AR in the future. More generally though, all of this is about operationalizing a set of principles for responsible innovation that guide our work in the lab. At Facebook, principles are not just a list of nice things. They describe trade-offs, things that we do even when the opposite might benefit us somehow. So, for example, when we're building, we should be transparent about how and when data is collected and used over time so that people are not surprised. We will build simple controls that are easy to understand and clear about the implications of a choice. And we build for all people of all backgrounds, including people who aren't using our products at all, but may be affected by them. We think about this a lot in the context of Project ARIA. And we strive to do what's right for our community, individuals, and our business, when faced with these trade-offs, we prioritize our community. Moreover, because we recognize the limits to our own understanding, we're working with third-party experts to expand our sphere of input. As part of these efforts, I'm happy to announce two RFPs for over a million dollars around the principle, Consider Everyone. This research will focus on the impact of AR, VR, and smart device technology on non-users, especially non-users from underrepresented and vulnerable communities, as well as best practices for fostering welcoming and inclusive environments in 3D spaces. You can find out more here. We've also been socializing these principles with experts across the privacy, safety, and ARVR community. And they've told us they're happy we wrote them. But talk is cheap. Trust is earned and not given. And we stand ready to be judged by what we do and not what we say. I want to give a special shout out to the tireless teams at FRL, delivering meaningful social presence across a lot of different products under very challenging conditions. The future of technology is bright, and I'm so proud to work with all of you. I mean, I've been excited about this technology for a long time. <laughs> Just like the labs that inspire us, we hope that our lab can play a role in helping shape the future. The need for this technology is all around us in 2020. Sheltering in place has only intensified my sense of urgency for this work. Every day away from my loved ones grows my conviction that this technology is important. But as excited as I am to introduce this to the world, I'm even more excited to use it myself. I mean, I miss seeing my family, my friends, my colleagues, and all of you. Be safe, and we hope to see you next year, one way or another. Right now, someone's working in the lab, and someone's going far away from someone that they love. 
for someone's working in the lab. So someone who is far away can be with who they love each day. Right now, some genius who's eight years old is dreaming of a degree in a distant place beyond the sea. But someone's working in the lab. So the genius who was eight years old can study from where they choose to live and be. Right now, there's someone wishing for some superpowers to run and play with super speed, finally freed. That someone wishing for some superpowers will one day live to be a super someone someone's working in the lab. We need each other in this world. We need not few of us, but all. That's why there's someone working in the lab. Right now. Right now, connecting with friends in VR is more important than ever. We want you to be able to spend time with your friends, your family, and your community in a way that defies distance and the physical constraints of the real world with virtual experiences. I'm Megan Fitzgerald, and this time last year, I shared our plans for Facebook Horizon, a social experience where you play, create, explore, and connect with others in an ever-expanding virtual world. Since then, We've been working hard to bring Horizon to everyone. A small group of early users and creators have been giving us feedback, and they're already building fantastic and incredibly creative worlds. And just last month, we opened the invite-only beta and began bringing people off the waitlist to join us in Horizon. And we're excited for more of you to join us soon and experience some of this. Now let's talk about venues, a social experience where people can come together from all over the world to enjoy events together. This year, people have attended concerts, NBA games, and stand-up performances. And now we're working on an improved version of venues. In fact, some of you may be watching today's keynote from the beta version already. There's a new lobby where you can socialize before, during, and after the show because we know one of the best parts of an event is chatting about the experience with others who were there. And we also have new content coming, including a brand partnership with Tidal. Beyond Horizon and venues, we want to make the experience across all of Oculus more social, so you can discover people to play with, experience new worlds together, and build communities as you explore. We've heard that people want easier ways to find each other in VR, to coordinate and jump into apps and experiences together. And of course, ways to easily find each other in those apps. So we're rolling out some new features in the coming months that'll make it even easier to play together. First, we're bringing Messenger to the Quest platform. With Messenger and Oculus, it's easier to coordinate with friends and play together in VR. When you're in VR, you can invite friends to join you through Messenger and they can quickly jump into the same game or experience with you. And this also means you can chat with friends anywhere they have Messenger without taking off the headset. We're introducing new Oculus avatars so people can express their identity and their personality with billions of permutations of customizations. Your avatar will be uniquely you. We're rolling out a new avatar SDK 
So developers can also use this new avatar system, which will eventually replace the Oculus avatars we have today. These avatars will build on the visual style you see in Horizon and Venues Beta today. They're an early version of our new system. Here's a glimpse of what they'll look like. Oh, hey, it's me. We also want to make sure your avatar can represent you across all realities. So over time, we'll be working to let you use your avatar across the Facebook family of apps. And then I want to introduce a new experience called Challenges. It's all about you, the VR community, showing off your skills in your favorite games. Challenges allow you to create mini tournaments and challenge friends, your community, or the whole world. Whether it's a week-long competition to see who can achieve a global high score on that new Beat Saber song, or a daily motivator to get you and your friends to play synth riders. Now, groups of friends can play together and challenge each other, even when they're not in VR at the same time. And developers can create their own featured challenges, starting with Beat Saber, Pistol Whip, and Synth Riders. They'll have new challenges available weekly, so you can compete to be the best of the best. Challenges roll out on Quest today, and will become available on Quest 2 when it launches later this year. And now, Chris Barber. Hi, my name's Chris Barber, and I work with the team that built Spark AR. Our team, together with our global creator community, is starting to transform the Facebook experiences you already use. These AR effects can be everything from helpful to entertaining. And by blending the digital with the real world, we can connect you to and allow you to communicate with people, places, and things in an entirely new way. Take shopping. With Instagram, we see the potential to bring the best of in-store shopping anywhere. Virtual Try-On has been around a few years and is one of the earliest examples of how AR can help you to make informed choices while shopping online. AR Try-On has been live in Facebook ads and with a small group of Instagram checkout partners since last year. And we're excited to bring AR Try-On to Facebook shops soon. So. What we've learned is that people feel more confident buying products like makeup or a lamp if they know how it'll look on them or in their home. Layer that with the ability to share with friends for a second opinion and buy without leaving the app and you'll start to see how this becomes not just a way to shop, but one that's fun, easy, and personal. And it's not just the store that you can bring home with AR. It can be a museum too. Museums and cultural institutions around the world are capturing art, history, culture, and science collections in full 3D. It's about preserving history, but also about inviting more people to explore and appreciate culture no matter where they are. Paired with Spark AR, these objects become accessible to people in new ways, even if they can't visit in person. We're working with the Smithsonian to bring mobile AR experiences into the palm of your hands that spark curiosity and learning. From a triceratops on your kitchen counter to a pair of boots from the Wiz dancing around your living room. In addition to the Smithsonian, other experiences, including ones from the Palace of Versailles, will begin rolling out this fall. We also want to explore how this storytelling magic can extend to journalism. To lead the charge, the New York Times has formed a new AR lab within their newsroom. They hope to delight and inform readers by using AR technology to shape how stories are told. By delivering these stories where people already spend time on Instagram, the Times can reach new audiences and help people better explore complex topics in an interactive way. One of the first stories seen here focuses on air pollution allowing you to see particulate levels from around the world in your own space. 
There are many more AR stories launching across print and digital in the coming months. Each of these examples show you how AR on your phone can be a window to a new world. But what if we want to transport you to a new world? Well, AR can do that too. Earlier, Boz mentioned how Spark is powering new virtual shared spaces. AR is one of Portal's most popular calling features, and it helps make small moments more memorable, like these fun birthday cards. Families can share in the joy of reading with story time. Rather than turn pages, AR brings the illustrations to life and actually lets the reader become characters in the story. Every day, parents tell us this makes a world of difference. While kids may not sit still for a phone call, story time can help families carve out a few special minutes with that relative who lives far away. We're working hard to expand the story time library. It's important that this collection reflect and celebrate all the stories of our portal families. The first in this new lineup will be Thank You Amu, the Caldecott honored debut from Oge Mora. Colorful, cut paper designs capture a heartwarming story of sharing and community, inspired by the female role models in her life. Thank You Amu is launching on Portal next month. We're also excited to bring Kevin Carroll's A Kid's Book About Belonging to Portal. Its core message is about helping kids love themselves, even if it feels like they don't fit in. It teaches them how this love can help them belong anywhere. We'll have more to share on these titles and others in the coming months. I hope this gave you just a taste of what's possible in AR. If you're feeling inspired, join us. Check out our Spark Creator session this afternoon and learn how you too can bring this AR-powered world to life. Now, to tell you more about the fully immersive VR worlds dreamed up by Oculus developers, please welcome Mike Verdu. I'm Mike Verdu, VP of Content. We are excited, encouraged, even stunned by the progress that VR has made in just 12 short months. So many wonderful Quest titles have launched in the last year, creating a catalog of rich, vibrant experiences. Our ecosystem growth is accelerating, and more and more developers are seeing success. But all of these positive developments are impossible to separate from the physical and emotional effects of the pandemic. This is an uncertain and difficult time. But creativity and art, well, they shine their brightest in uncertain times. And our new medium is bringing us together, even as many of us are far apart. We hope our technology is helping you to feel more connected. Whether you're hopping into VR with a friend to hang out, play a game together, get some work done, or exploring experiences like in protests, which lets you become better acquainted with the unsung heroes preserving and extending our constitutional rights in the name of black lives and racial justice. Our developers are finding new ways to stay connected as well, showing us the future of work as they defy physical distance to create amazing products. We salute these teams as they redefine the work ethic and compassion of this industry adapting their processes in a new paradigm to launch titles that span every corner of the globe. So, five months ago, we shared that 10 developers had made over $2 million in revenue from Quest content alone. Today, I'm happy to share that over 35 titles on Quest have generated revenue in the million since launch, and they're doing it faster than ever before. This summer, Onward's Quest debut made a million dollars in revenue in just four days, faster than any other title on the platform. And Five Nights at Freddy's Help Wanted reached a million dollars in just eight days. These are powerful milestones that show how more and more teams are able to pursue continued VR development and see a return on investment. And as a result, there is an acceleration in creativity in all categories from games to productivity, collaboration, fitness, education, and others. The coming year will be an exciting one. 
We have some major announcements as we continue growing our slate with the launch of Quest 2. So let's dive into this exciting new content. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Laverso, Vice President of Product Development at Ubisoft's Red Storm Entertainment. Ubisoft is pioneers in new technology. We're early investors in new consoles and tech, and we've been creating VR experiences since 2016, with titles like Eagle Flight, Werewolves Within, and Star Trek Bridge Crew, which are all available on the Oculus platform. And today, we are excited to announce our first AAA franchises for the VR market, which are Assassin's Creed and Splinter Cell. For the first time ever, fans will be able to live these beloved franchises in a truly visceral way. Development of Assassin's Creed and Splinter Cell will be led by Ubisoft Redstorm in collaboration with Ubisoft Reflections, Ubisoft Dusseldorf, and Ubisoft Mumbai. Both titles will be created from the ground up exclusively for the Oculus platform and will include elements of both the Assassin's Creed and Splinter Cell franchises that players know and love. We are excited to share more about these projects with you. Stay tuned. Thanks for kicking us off with that awesome news. Hi everyone, I'm Ruth Bram, and I've been a producer at Oculus for over six years, helping our developers make games and entertainment experiences for our platform. So let's talk about Quest. In addition to exploring the Quest content library with Quest 2, you'll be able to dive into original experiences with even greater scope and superior quality, thanks to the advanced capabilities of this new hardware. So I've asked a few of our developers making awesome games with Quest 2 to join us today and share their exciting news. Hi everyone, I'm Jose Perez III, director of Star Wars Tales from the Galaxy's Edge. At ILMX Lab, we've been hard at work crafting tales and expanding the world of Black Spire Outpost, which was created by our friends at Walt Disney Imagineering. After the award-winning success of Vader Immortal, we wanted to follow up with something lighthearted and a little more open a project that will expand over time. So, we'd like to invite you to explore the wilds of Batu. Danger lurks around every corner, but it's nothing you can't handle with the help of specialized training droids and a good blaster at your side. Or, you could always just hang out in the cantina. The bartender, Cecil Slack, might not make the best drinks, but he can tell a story that will literally transport you to a different time and place in the Star Wars galaxy. One of these tales will put you face to face with an iconic and powerful Jedi, Master Yoda. Before we go, let's take a sneak peek at one of the characters you'll join forces with along the way. Someone, anyone, please help! My counterpart R2D2 and I were on board a part supply vessel bound for Batu, but it was attacked. You didn't worry, I am a highly trained resistant spy. Dear. You'll do what? Oh, don't be silly. You'll never make it. My circuits have had quite enough of the wilds for one day. Hi, I'm Cha Chin, founder and CEO of Big Box VR. We've been working very hard on Population One, a battle royale that is only possible in VR. I'm excited to share with you that it's coming soon to the Quest and Rift platforms, and you'll be able to cross-play between headsets. What makes our game special is our vertical combat system. You have the freedom to climb anything and fly anywhere in a fully immersive VR world. After launch, we will have ongoing live and game events, so you will always have something fun to do with your friends. I can't wait for you to jump into Population 1 with us and I'll see you in the game.
I'm Jan, head of the development at Beat Games. First, thank you to our passionate Beat Saber community. We could not have announced this incredible news without your continued support. For a while now, we've been exploring ways to play Beat Saber with a friend, or with many friends. I'm excited to share that Beat Saber multiplayer will be launching on October 13th. This is the biggest update to the game since we launched. I can't wait for you to try it. And we have one more thing from Depp. Thanks, Jan. As you all know, music is core to Beat Saber. Thinking of who we could celebrate the launch of Quest 2 with, one artist came to mind immediately. Their music spreads positivity, transcends languages and borders, and has touched many lives, including mine. I am so excited to announce that our next music pack will be in partnership with BTS, featuring their recently launched characters, Tiny Tan. Tiny Tan have fun and distinct personalities inspired by the personas of BTS members. Through the magic door, they cross over from their universe to ours, transcending reality and imagination. I'm eager for you to meet them in the world of Beat Saber this November, and for you to play with other fans in multiplayer mode. Hello, I'm Apoorva Gandhi, brand manager at Crytek. It's hard to believe that the climb launched five years ago before Rift even supported the touch controllers. Now, more than ever, it's crucial to expand our horizon, explore the virtual world and connect with others. With a new city setting, 15 new maps, events, leaderboards, and more. We've been overwhelmed by the sustained community support received on the Climb franchise, and we can't wait to share the Climb 2 with you soon. Hi, I'm Brian Gomez, executive producer on the Universal Games and Digital Platforms team. Here at Universal, storytelling is at the heart of everything we do, and we're always looking for new and innovative ways for our fans to experience the worlds we create. We're excited to do exactly that, in partnership with Oculus and CoatSync, by bringing you Jurassic World Aftermath. It's a thrilling survival adventure built from the ground up for VR. Experiencing Jurassic World in VR is a special kind of wish fulfillment. Set two years after the fall of Jurassic World, Jurassic World Aftermath lets you race through Isla Nublar, retrieving valuable information while being stalked by deadly velociraptors at every turn. You're gonna need to think quick, solve puzzles, and use all of your survival skills to get out alive. So here it is, your first look at Jurassic World Aftermath. I'm so thankful for the relationship we've built with some of the developers behind these games, like Jurassic World Aftermath and Star Wars Tales from the Galaxy's Edge, to ensure they're comfortable and engaging and an incredibly fun experience for you. 
And I wanna share my enthusiasm for all of these new titles because it doesn't stop here for the Quest platform. We're gonna be rolling out even more high quality and cutting edge content. So let's take a look at some of the other titles coming to Quest. The Adepta Sororitas are brought to life in jaw-dropping visceral reality. Embody these merciless women as they root out corruption in the war-torn world of Warhammer 40K Battle Sister. This holiday season, Pistol Whip will debut 2089, a gritty and cinematic sci-fi expansion where you'll set out to survive an off-world plague of killer machines with all new weapons and music. In over 25 years since its creation, Myst is being reimagined for VR. Solve puzzles and travel through the ages in this graphic adventure classic. Then get ready to fight the undead and face gut-wrenching choices for you and other survivors in The Walking Dead, Saints and Sinners. And coming soon, keep to the shadows and take aim in Sniper Elite VR. Japan is home to a community of early Oculus adopters and has a strong history of game development. As we prepare for the launch of Quest 2, we've been fortunate to partner with well-known Japanese developers and have committed significant and long-term marketing and development budgets to Japanese developed titles. So we're bringing Oculus to Japan in a bigger way than ever before, with Quest 2 available in more stores and with more content. At launch, you'll see games like Kizuna Eye, Touch the Beat from Activate, Res Infinite from Enhance, Space Channel 5 VR Kinda Funky Newsflash from Grounding, and Little Witch Academia VR from Universe. And later on, we're also looking forward to bringing our Japanese audience titles like Alt Deus Beyond Kronos from My Dearest, Puzzle Bobble from Servios and Taito Corporation, and many more. Now you're probably asking, what about PC? We know that PC gamers are looking for a best-in-class experience. And that's why they've embraced Rift as the gold standard for high-fidelity gaming. But now we've got something that offers you an even better experience than Rift. Quest 2 Plus Link gives you a higher resolution at a lower cost and future support for higher frame rates up to 90 hertz. It's the best way across the VR industry to play PC VR content. So if you have a VR-ready PC, you can use your Quest 2 Plus Link to play upcoming Rift titles from our talented indie developers, and also upcoming titles like Lone Echo 2 and Medal of Honor Above and Beyond. Hello there. I am Peter Hirschman, the game director of Medal of Honor Above and Beyond. I am terrible at making videos like this, so please bear with me. However, I would like to tell you it's been a phenomenal few years working with our good friends at Oculus to bring you a brand new Medal of Honor title. In Medal of Honor Above and Beyond, we're putting you in the boots of a World War II soldier so we can tell the stories of ordinary people doing extraordinary things in the face of overwhelming odds. I'm happy to announce that Medal of Honor is shipping December 11th on Rift. It's playable on Quest with a link cable, and I'm very excited to announce it's shipping at the same time on Steam with full Steam VR support and crossplay. We're really looking forward to seeing you in the game. Please take care of yourself and wash your hands. So as you can see, we're committed to the Oculus platform as the paragon of VR content. And that's why we're partnering with some of the most talented game studios in the industry to craft powerful and memorable experiences. Whether it's stepping inside the worlds that you know and love, exploring new ones, or even making connections with friends and family in spite of distance. And I bet you the titles we're launching in the years to come will be some of the best games in VR that you have ever played. Now, here's Maria to discuss the future of work. Last year at Oculus Connect, I shared a vision for our VR-enabled future of work.
where we could work from anywhere. I say it will take years, probably, before we could make the vision a reality. But then, nearly overnight, around the world, everything changed. And suddenly, we were forced to learn what it means to work remotely. And we experienced the joys, like being able to have lunch with your family every day, and the challenges, like building new relationships online, collaborating on complex problems, and sometimes feeling lonely. We are relying on a mixed bag of ways to connect. Email, video, chat, they all work, okay. But VR has the potential to get us closer to what we know we can achieve in person, and a lot more. Our vision remains the same, but we have accelerated our efforts to get there. Whether you're on your own, running a small business, or at a Fortune 500, we think VR can help you work better. We are learning every day from the creative ways people are using VR. Scientists, for example, are doing collaborative drug discovery from home. We definitely need that right now. And every day, more companies ask whether VR could be good for them too. That's where Oculus for Business comes in. It already offers professional features like fleet management or enterprise-grade support. It's built on Workbase, our solution trusted by companies of all sizes, from SMBs to the world's biggest companies. We offer business-friendly ways to log in to the headset, like workplace accounts or no account at all. We are rolling out resources to help companies get started and for developers to meet this growing demand. This includes a new vendor directory and business channels designed specifically for app distribution directly to administrators. Quest 2 is going to be great for all types of work. It is lightweight and ergonomic, so it's more comfortable for longer work sessions. New accessories, like our Elite Strap with battery, are designed to increase comfort and extend battery life. Compared to Quest, Quest 2 is packed with better processing power, so you can run heavier apps more smoothly. There's also a higher resolution display, so you can read text in docs and presentations more easily. On their own, these features are exciting, but combined, we will push standalone VR to new limits. We believe VR will be your next computer, a better way to surf the web, play games, chat with friends, and collaborate with your colleagues across distance. But before we can connect you to others, we need to help you, on your own, get things done. I'm so excited to introduce Infinite Office. Now, when I say Infinite Office, I am not talking about that feeling when you have been like working from home for 14 hours straight, although that might feel infinite. This is something else. Check it out. Infinite Office is a collection of features we will be rolling out over the coming months. What you saw in the video illustrates the experience as we envision it. 
These are new capabilities we are designing to make your office, wherever it is, feel more productive and flexible. Let's talk about some of the features you will see first. Thinking about your workspace, we begin with this big area with multiple customizable screens, all without expensive monitors eating up space. And across them, Oculus Browser provides you with a desktop class web experience. The next cool thing is that the experience integrates with your real environment. You can attach those panels to multiple surfaces, like a table or a couch or a desk. It's easily portable and persistent, so you can pick things up right where you left off. Now you are truly free to take your office with badass monitors wherever you go. And you may be thinking, Maria, that's all great, but how can I work in VR if I can't even type in there? We all know one of the biggest barriers has been text input. So we took care of that too. In partnership with Logitech, we are bringing a physical keyboard into VR. You will be able to actually see your keyboard and your hands finally type, and yes, even copy paste. My team and lots of others at Facebook are already trying out this infinite office. Initial features begin rolling out to Quest 2, first in experimental release this winter, so you can join us. We are starting with solo productivity, but there's a lot more we can do with these capabilities. We always want to power use cases that connect people and promote collaboration, and we have more in store. But I can't talk about that quite yet. There's one last thing I want to mention. We are committed to putting these technologies in the hands of developers too. And we have already started. Check out this prototype we did with Spatial that layers pass through with their collaboration app. That's just a glimpse, and we'll have more to share next year. It is amazing to see how far we've come since launching Quest only last year. But if you want to know where we're headed, and who doesn't, Michael Abrash is just the person to show you. Good morning. I so wish I could be talking to you in person but I'm still very much looking forward to sharing some of the AR technology we're developing at FRL Research. First, though, a quick update. Last year, I mentioned that my grandson had just been born. Now he's almost a year old, and he has changed a bit. In fact, he's grown so much and changed so rapidly that it's made me reflect on how remarkable the course of a lifetime really is. And thinking back on my own life, I realized that the things that have really mattered both personally and professionally, have been the ones that I planted as tiny seeds and that then grew over the years and touched ever more people's lives. In the long run, there is truly no more satisfying feeling, and I'm deeply confident that we'll all have that feeling when we look back on ARVR years from now. Because, as I've discussed at Past Connects, ARVR is the second great wave of human-oriented computing, combining real and virtual to explore the limits of human experience and change the way we live. Today, I'm going to talk about some of the technologies we're developing to enable the first generation of true AR glasses. Glasses that let us mix real and virtual freely and that are good enough to become part of everyday life. Now, be aware that this is research. Those technologies may take up to 10 years to make their way into products, if they ever make it there at all. That seems like a long time, but it's just the beginning. What's coming over the long arc of AR VR will be far more than any of us can imagine today. Just as the personal computer developers of 40 years ago, myself included, could not have imagined the long arc of personal computing that's created the digital world we live in today. For all the ways personal computing has evolved over the last half century though, one thing has remained constant over all that time, and that is the basic way humans interact with the digital world in the form of the GUI, the graphical user interface, which has been the gold standard of human-computer interaction since Doug Engelbart's mother of all demos in 1968. Information is presented to us on a 2D surface. We navigate it and select it with pointing, dragging, and clicking, and new information is presented. That has been phenomenally successful. But AR glasses need their own Engelbart moment, a new user interface that is fundamentally different from the GUI. 
A paradigm shift is needed because always-on AR glasses have the potential to be integral to almost everything we do. They will always be available to help us communicate, navigate, learn, share, and act. So the user interface has to work seamlessly no matter what we're doing. What's more, AR glasses will be able to see our lives as we see them. So for the first time, it will be possible for AI to be truly personalized and contextualized. That, in turn, opens the door to an interface that's proactive rather than reactive, that's intuitive, that understands our intent and acts almost before we know we need it. Ideally, that interface would have very little friction, would be highly reliable and private, and would allow us to remain completely present in the real world at all times. Most of all, the ideal AR interface would, for the first time, put us at the center of our personal technology, rather than adapting and reacting to our devices as we do today. Those are very ambitious goals, and it will take decades to fully realize them. But by planting the seeds now, we can get to AR's Engelbart moment, and then get that interface into people's hands over the next 10 years. There are many pieces that have to come together to enable the AR interface, including a breakthrough display system, a novel graphics pipeline, and new types of sensors, and we're working on all of them. But today, I'm going to focus on three areas that are at the heart of redefining the way we interact with the digital world. Input and output, mapping the real world, and the interface itself. Input, how we send information to our devices, and output, how our devices send information to us, form the foundation for all human-computer interaction. AR input and output are uniquely challenging because they need to work easily and intuitively in all the situations we encounter in our daily lives. Let's look at two research areas that have the potential to revolutionize the AR interface. The first is electromyography, or EMG, a novel input approach that can read the signals on the motor neurons that run through the wrist to the hand. EMG is still in the research phase, but the Control Labs team that joined us last year is advancing the state of the art rapidly, as we can see in this video. In a sense, this is a brain-computer interface, but it's an interface that operates where the brain signals are stronger, easier to read, and less ambiguous than on the head. In fact, the signals through the wrist are so clear that EMG can detect finger motion of just a millimeter, so input can be very discreet, and ultimately, it may even be possible to sense just the intent to move a finger. An EMG can be made highly reliable, like a mouse click or a key press. Finally, it can be very intuitive, since it can utilize actions you already do with your hands. Initially, EMG will provide just one or two bits of what I'll call neural click, the equivalent of tapping on a button or pressing and then releasing it, but it will quickly progress to richer controls. Here are a few early samples of how it could be used in AR. Pretty cool, but that's just the beginning. It's highly likely that ultimately we will be able to type at high speed with EMG, maybe even at higher speed than it is possible with a keyboard today. Initial research is promising, as we can see in this video. So far, I've only shown scenarios that map to normal use of the hands, but there's plenty of bandwidth through the wrist to support novel controls. Imagine you put on an EMG bracelet and a Quest and look at your hand, and you have a sixth finger. You start to flex your hand and quickly gain independent control of that new finger. Then you take off the Quest, but you can still use that finger to click. Totally discreet and highly intuitive. Pretty much the ideal one-bit input. Is the brain that neuroplastic? We don't know yet, but this next video makes me optimistic.
That person was born with the limited hand functionality you saw, but it took him only five minutes to learn to control the virtual hand. There are years of research yet to do, but EMG has the potential to be the core input device for AR glasses. The other novel input-output area is audio in the form of several research technologies that together have the potential to transform human communication. Let's start with beamforming, which leverages a microphone array to enhance sound from any desired direction. Beamforming makes it possible for AR glasses to extract your voice out of virtually any soundscape, so the person on the other end of a call can hear you even if you're in a crowded cafe speaking in a normal voice. Next, let's add in-ear monitors, custom audio devices like this research prototype that fit in your ear and can selectively filter ambient sound. Now, when you get that call in a noisy cafe, the glasses can mute the ambient noise so you can comfortably hear the caller. Next up are personalized head-related transfer functions, or HRTFs, personalized digital representations of the acoustic characteristics of our ears and heads that enable us to hear virtual sounds with the same clear directionality as in the real world. Now we can place virtual callers in specific locations near you, so conversations become much more natural and easy to follow. The final technology is audio propagation, simulation of how sounds move around spaces, which enables us to generate the subtle echoes and reverberations needed to create a convincing soundscape. Put all those technologies together, and virtual conversations can be indistinguishable from real ones, even when you're in a noisy environment. What if you're trying to talk to someone who's actually there with you in that noisy cafe? Just turn on beamforming, point the glasses at the person you want to talk with, and the glasses will pick out that person's voice and mute the ambient noise. If they have AR glasses too, direct glasses-to-glasses -glasses transmission will enable you to have a natural, relaxed conversation. This is all research right now, but when it's product ready, AR glasses will give us audio superpowers. Let's walk through a scenario of how audio superpowers could enhance our lives. First, let's see how the scenario would work with today's technology. By the way, you'll get the best experience of this audio section if you listen with headphones or in Oculus venues. Okay, let's say you go to that noisy cafe and want to study. The noise makes it hard to concentrate. Then a friend comes in. You try to talk, but it's hard and tiring due to the noise. Sorry, Sarah. I didn't mean to make a jump. I didn't see you come in. Parking took forever. I had to circle the block. Another friend comes in, and it's even harder, because now you're not always looking at the speaker when they start to talk, and seeing mouth movements is a big part of how you understand speech in noisy environments. Sorry, guys. Let me guess. Parking? Yes. I had to for the last part. What did I miss? Finally, a friend video calls in. You all crowd around a phone and try to hear what they're saying on speaker, and they try to hear you over all the ambient noise. Perfect. Hang on, let me flip the camera. How awesome is this? They do these amazing balloon bouquets. They're beautiful. Millie would totally love that. Oh, did you find a birthday cake to jump out of? What? Not a very satisfying experience. Now, let's see what it's like with audio superpowers. You sit down to study in the cafe and turn on ambient muting. It's easy to focus. A friend comes in. They have to tap you on the shoulder to get your attention. Oh, sorry, Sarah. I didn't mean to make you jump. I didn't see you come in. But then you turn on beamforming, and they come through clear as a bell. And their voice sounds like it's coming from them, not from a speaker. Parking took forever. I had to circle the block. That's okay. I was working on the list. I see that. It's clearly labeled Millie's Surprise Party. Another friend joins you. You hear whoever you're looking at clearly. Although sometimes when the speaker changes, you miss a few words until you turn your head. Party after all. Sorry I'm late, guys. What did I miss? Wait, where's my guess? Parking? Mark is looking for a birthday cake to jump out. for the last spot. Wait, where's Mark? Finally, a friend calls in. You answer. Conference everyone's glasses in, and you all talk freely. That's him now. Hey, Mark. Leslie and Danny are here. Perfect. Hang on. Let me flip the camera. How awesome is this? They do these amazing balloon bouquets. They're beautiful. Thanks to your personalized HRTF, you can pick a specific location for your virtual friend's voice, just like your friends who are there in the flesh have a physical location. It's a lot like sitting around a table in your own dining room. Millie would totally love that. Did you find a birthday cake to jump out of? The second scenario still isn't perfect, but it's vastly better. 
and later on, we'll see how to make it pretty much perfect. Let's shift gears now and look at machine perception, a very different but equally important aspect of building the AR interaction model of the future. This is similar to, but more far-reaching than computer vision, in that it involves your AR glasses not only sensing the state of the world around you, but also building a detailed, dynamic, persistent 3D map of the parts of the world that are relevant to you, and developing an understanding of everything that map contains. Let's look at what that means and what it implies. The foundation of AR is the ability to have persistent, shareable virtual entities of all sorts embedded in the real world, including such things as whiteboards, screens, CAD models, notes, pictures, rooms, outdoor settings, and avatars. The ability to have virtual entities is like a magic wand that lets you customize, annotate, and enhance your world, and share that with others however you wish. None of that can happen without a detailed 3D map of the parts of the world that are personally relevant to you, for several reasons. First, virtual objects have to be world-locked to be useful and convincing. That is, they have to remain steady with respect to the real world, just as real objects do. That requires accurate and robust tracking of where the head is with respect to the world. Now, head tracking alone doesn't require a detailed 3D map, just a current set of environment features to track. However, it gets trickier if you want world-locked persistent objects. How can they persist without some sort of database to store their locations? That becomes even more true when you want to share virtual objects with other people. That requires a common coordinate system, and again, there's no general solution other than indexing into a shared 3D map. And then, if you want to be able to share space with a convincing avatar of a friend who lives in another state, not only are precise location and orientation needed, but also knowledge of the things in the space around you, so the avatar doesn't end up cut in half by a table and can be placed in natural poses, such as sitting in a chair. So both a selectively shareable model of the parts of the world that are relevant to you and an index of everything in that model are necessary in order for AR to mix virtual and real effectively. Finally, a 3D map of the world is necessary in order to allow AR glasses to run all day within a very tight power and thermal envelope. It would take far too much power if the glasses had to constantly reassess their context from scratch. So instead, they'll download the most recent data from the map, and then only have to handle dynamic changes, which are propagated back to the map. The end-to-end -end machine perception platform we're building that enables all of this is called Live Maps. Live Maps consists of a stack of three primary layers. The bottom layer, Location, provides an accurate frame of reference for the locations of the wearer and their surroundings. That might not sound like much, but establishing highly accurate, always available, consistent, shareable 3D location and orientation in a way that can scale is in fact a tremendous challenge. The index layer builds on location to create a detailed 3D map of all the physical surfaces, structures, and objects in the parts of the real world that are relevant to you. This is a unique personal map based on your own location history, although parts may be shared to the extent that you and others choose to allow. For example, public places could be globally shared. Index does quite a bit more than just provide static geometry, though. It also identifies objects and provides metadata about them, such as appearance, mass, modes of use, interaction with other objects, and dynamic motion. The index layer can tell you what kind of tree you're looking at, where you left your keys, and how many calories are in the sandwich you're about to eat. And it can predict the landing point for a tennis ball in flight. Finally, the content layer stores locations of virtual objects that are anchored to the real world, indexing them into the map. So the three layers together enable us to have virtual entities freely mixed with the real world. But powerful as that is, it's only one of two ways that Live Maps enables the full potential of AR glasses, and the content layer is the key to the second. Content is actually a somewhat misleading name because the information the top layer stores is much broader than what is usually thought of as content. A better name might be the personal ontology layer. Ontology is a bit of an esoteric word, but for our purposes, it means that the top layer stores the relationships, histories, and predictions for the entities and events that matter personally to each of us, whether they're anchored in the real world or not, along with the interconnections with a variety of global knowledge graphs. It might store a virtual vase you have on the dining room table, but it also might store non-geolocated information, such as the name of your favorite Thai restaurant, or the people who have RSVP'd for your party next week, or the ETA for your flight to Atlanta. And it links those nodes to knowledge graphs that define the concepts of restaurant, party, and ETA. In short, 
It's the set of concepts and categories and their properties and the relations between them that model your life to whatever extent you desire, and it can, at any time, surface the information that's personally and contextually relevant to you. So the location layer says where things are. The index layer says what's known about physical things. And the content layer says why things, physical, virtual, and conceptual, matter to each of us personally. You will have your own set of layers based on your unique life experience. So live maps will effectively be a virtual model of your life up to that moment. And that is the foundation for the second key aspect of machine perception, a truly personalized and contextualized AI assistant. To date, assistants have been able to understand relatively little about your personal context and needs, but that changes with AR glasses. Now, by querying live maps, an assistant can observe your world from an egocentric view, the same way you see it from a first-person perspective, and that is the basis for true human-centered technology. Obviously, we're a long way from that now. In particular, we don't have the necessary egocentric training data. So the question is, how are we going to bootstrap this breakthrough AI assistant? Which brings us to Project ARIA. Project ARIA is a research effort built around the custom glasses you see here that is designed to record high quality egocentric data, which in turn will enable researchers to advance the state of the art around machine perception and personalized contextually aware AI. Project ARIA is not in itself an AR device since it lacks a display and it is neither a product nor a prototype of a product and will not be for sale. It is a research tool, and it is a critical step on the path to live maps and the interface of the future. One way to think about Project ARIA is as an evolution of the methods which were used to build maps in the past. Since the 1960s, satellites have allowed us to map outdoor environments at tremendous scale, but they're limited in the map resolution and freshness they can produce. Low-flying aircraft and car fleets provided data capture at a higher resolution with increased update rates, but they're limited to outdoor environments. Backpack rigs can now map indoor spaces at high resolution, but are unable to fully capture the wide range of environments relevant to our daily lives. Project ARIA is the vanguard of the next leap in data capture technology, client-based mapping, which will one day enable anyone with an AR device to build and use live maps wherever and whenever they need to based on data from their own devices, particularly AR glasses. The use of egocentric data will make it possible to construct higher resolution maps that are dynamically updated at a much higher frequency and will enable mapping of a far greater spectrum of environments than has been possible with any previous mapping technology. In addition to enabling state-of-the-art research into map building, Project ARIA will let researchers explore what data AR glasses will need to capture in actual use and how AI can most usefully leverage that data to provide personalized assistance. Let's take a look at each component of Project ARIA in closer detail. At its heart, Project ARIA is an all-day wearable computer and sensor platform with a powerful mobile class processor, all wrapped up in an ergonomic glasses form factor weighing under 70 grams. The device is controlled by the wearer using a mobile companion app, which communicates via an encrypted low-energy Bluetooth link. As Boz noted, once a data sequence has been recorded and the device is placed on charge, data is uploaded to Facebook's research servers and kept in quarantine, meaning it's not made available to researchers. During the quarantine period, participants can delete segments of captured data from the system without accessing the raw data. Any data that is gathered in public places is also passed through a set of privacy filters by our system to automatically blur faces and license plates. A prominent LED indicates when the device is recording, and ending a recording is as simple as flicking the mute switch on the side of the glasses. Project ARIA supports a variety of sensors that gather the sort of data that AR glasses will need to capture. These include a front-facing RGB camera, two side-facing monochrome cameras, and dual IMUs, which each contain an accelerometer and a gyroscope. This combination of sensors allows us to both observe the environment and track the position of the glasses, the wearer's hands, and objects within the scene. In this example, we can see the trajectory of the device being calculated from both the camera and the IMUs as the glasses wearer interacts in an apartment setting. In addition to sensors to visually observe the world, Project ARIA supports seven directional microphones for spatialized audio capture 
and two inward-facing cameras to monitor the direction of the wearer's gaze. By combining data from the inward-facing sensors with live maps, our researchers have shown we can project the gaze of the wearer into the map of their environment, creating a powerful tool for understanding user intent. The combination of these powerful sensing, location, and indexing technologies with an always-on wearable form factor raises important questions about the privacy controls that will need to be in place to prevent misuse. Project ARIA has been developed precisely to enable us to address those challenges long before AR glasses are commercially available and, as Boz described, already has privacy controls in place. Starting this month, Facebook employees will be using Project ARIA devices in public and private spaces, including their homes, and also on our campuses once they reopen, in order to help inform the development of live maps and contextualized AI. That's just a quick look at the capabilities that Project ARIA brings to AR and AI research, but I hope you now have a sense of why it's an essential part of building the machine perception foundation for the AR future. Which brings us to the last technology we'll discuss today, the AR interaction model. If you recall, earlier I said that the ideal AR interface would be always available, no matter what you're doing, intuitive to learn and use with very low friction, highly reliable and private. It would be personalized and proactive, understanding your context and intent. Finally, it would allow you to main, remain present in the real world rather than being distracted away from it by your devices. Nothing like that exists today, but between live maps and the input-output technologies we discussed earlier, we now have the foundation we need to build that interface. There are actually two distinct aspects to AR interaction. The first is what I'll call high-bandwidth focused interaction. This includes direct person-to-person -person communication, such as spatialized calls and avatar interactions, as well as direct six degree of freedom manipulation of virtual objects. The audio technology we looked at earlier is key here, as are the hand tracking technology that shipped for Quest and the codec avatars that I discussed at the last Connect. These tend to be used for focused interactions with virtual objects or other people, such as the audio scenario we looked at earlier, or virtually collaborating on a CAD model. These sorts of interactions are intuitive, low friction, and easy to learn because they simulate actions we're already familiar with and will be used in well-defined modes. This is similar to how intuitive typing text into computers was when they were introduced, thanks to typewriters. This means that high bandwidth interaction, while highly important, won't require any fundamental leaps in the interaction model. Which is good news, but that's the easy part. The hard part is the always available interface, the one that's a constant part of your daily life, that helps you with everything you do without taking you out of the world. This is the general interaction model that will transform our relationship with the digital world every bit as much as the GUI has. Right now, this is an early stage research project, but I'd like to share a bit of our thinking because I believe it will become central to our lives over the next decade or so. Our core concept is to make interaction as powerful, easy and intuitive as possible. And that's built on two pillars. The first pillar, as you'd expect, is very low friction input technology. So when you need to act, the path from thought to action is as short and smooth as possible. Many input technologies will play a part in the AR interface, but EMG is the core of this pillar. The second pillar is the use of AI, context, and personalization to scope the effects of your input actions as tightly as possible to your needs at any given moment so that user input can be as quick, simple, and intuitive as possible. Ideally, you'd only have to click once to do what you want to do, or even better, the right thing would happen without you having to do anything at all. Advances in many areas are needed to enable this pillar, but the foundation is live maps. I'm calling the interaction model built on these two pillars the ultra-low friction contextualized AI interface. And yes, I am aware that Ulfkai doesn't roll off the tongue like GUI. Let me know if you have a better name. To make this more concrete, let's revisit what our audio scenario might look like in the future. You sit down to study in the cafe and start to read. The assistant sees what you're doing and detects that the environment is noisy. So it asks whether you'd like muting turned on, and you neural click yes. Now it's easy to focus. A friend comes in and comes over to say hello. Hey Sarah, parking took forever. I had to circle the block. The assistant knows to let their voice through, even though the ambient noise is still muted, 
and proactively enables beamforming. The two of you have a normal conversation despite the noisy environment, and it all happens automatically. It feels like it needs a code name in case this list gets out. Oh, and here's Leslie. As you talk, another friend joins you, and the assistant adds them as well. Thanks to the microphone array and visual sensors, the assistant is aware that you're engaged in conversation and machine perception and audio direction of arrival analysis. Let it determine who and where the speakers are. So it automatically enhances the voice of whoever is speaking, whether you're looking at them or not, and you never miss a word. What did I miss? Wait, where's Mark? Seems like the husband should be here. This is his wife's birthday party after all. Finally, a third friend calls in. The assistant knows that all four of you are friends and asks whether you'd like to add the caller to the group discussion. You neural click yes while staying present with your friends. No need to look down That's or take now. a phone out of your pocket. Hey Mark. The assistant Leslie answers, conferences the caller in with all three of you, and leveraging live maps, automatically audio spatializes the caller into the empty seat at the table and displays their photorealistic avatar there as well. I was thinking we could fill the whole living room with them. Audio propagation, together with live maps, allows simulation of the proper acoustics of the space you're in, so the voices sound natural. Thanks to beamforming and glasses-to-glasses -glasses transmission, everyone can hear and be heard clearly. Now, it truly is as if all four of you were sitting around a table in the quiet of your own dining room. And then everyone could jump out from behind the balloons. They're beautiful. Millie would totally love that. What, did you find a birthday cake to jump out of? What? Seriously, who wouldn't want that? Everyone would benefit from communicating better in noisy environments, including, in particular, the 20 to 30% of the population that suffers from some degree of hearing impairment. In this scenario, the assistant was able to guess your intent most of the time and proactively do the right thing, and was able to ask a simple question to disambiguate when it wasn't sure. That allowed you to stay in the world, and together with audio superpowers, was a great example of how AR glasses can actually connect us more deeply rather than distracting us. Many cases are more challenging, but once we have AR glasses, we'll have the data that's needed to develop AI that can help you in an ever-increasing variety of personalized ways. What else will the ultra-low friction contextualized AI interface enable? That's kind of like asking what the GUI would enable back in 1967. The possibilities are vast and open-ended, and there will surely be some world-changing surprises. But here's a small sample. The interface could show you texts, email, and caller information, customizing whether, when, and how it alerts you, depending on priority and your current situation, such as whether you're talking with someone, and it could locate the alerts in the real world in ways that don't distract you. And it could automatically connect calls from people it knows you want to talk with as if they had walked up to you and said hello. It could act as your camera assistant, freeing you up to enjoy the moment. It could enhance contrast in low light or for people with poor vision. It could remind you to put on a raincoat as you're heading out when the forecast is for rain in the afternoon. It could warm up your car just before you leave for work. Someday, when cars are self-driving, it could show for you to and from work and your scheduled appointments. It could provide precise navigation guidance, both outdoors and indoors. You could ask it where the hot pockets are when you're in the supermarket, and it would take you to the exact location and highlight them on the shelf. And then it could recommend a more nutritious snack. It could find your car in a parking lot. It could remember where you left your keys, and it could warn you when you're absentmindedly about to cross against the light. It could provide relevant contextual information ranging from points of interest to restaurant menus to whatever you're curious about at the moment. If you look for a few seconds at the Empire State Building or a flower or a book, the interface might ask you whether you'd like to know more, depending on your past interests and preferences. It could guide you through almost any sort of task, ranging from cooking to home repair to gardening, which would, in particular, make valuable skills available in areas that have limited access to professional assistance. And it could improve educational access by making it possible for everyone to have a personalized tutor. That's only a tiny fraction of what the AR interface of the future will enable, but it gives you a sense of its vast potential to enhance our lives by not only putting us back in the world, but for the first time, at the center of personal technology that adapts to us. The road to the ultra-low friction contextualized AI interface is a long and challenging one. But between EMG, egocentric data, and contextualized AI, I have not the slightest doubt that something a lot like what I've described will be how we will all work, play, and connect
for however long the second wave of human-oriented computing lasts, which I think will be a very long time. I'd like to leave you today with one final thought. Technological revolutions don't just happen. Each one is created by a unique group of inspired, motivated people who can look ahead and see the long arc of the future while everyone else still thinks it's science fiction and who choose to spend their precious time creating that future. We, all of us working on ARVR, are those people. We're creating that future right now, planting seeds that will grow longer and farther and touch more lives than any of us can imagine today. And believe me, there is no better place to be in the course of a lifetime. Thank you.